Now look at this other little phrase. There we go. Welcome to another episode of Just Podding Around. I'm your host, Reese Williams, and back again is Michael Washington. And today we're reviewing King and Queen of the Ring and Double or Nothing from AEW. Now, before we kick off into that, I just want to uh, say rest in peace to Bill Walton, legend of the NBA, two-time champion, MVP, father of Luke Walton. So condolences to the Walton family. Be a hard time. Lost his battle to cancer a few days ago. So rest him. Uh, hopefully he rests easy now, so, and congratulations to Manchester City, or Manchester United, sorry, for winning the FA Cup over the weekend, well earned, I never saw, thought I would see them winning, since Manchester City were a much better team, so, yeah, uh, congratulations yeah. to Man U, and, you know, my uh, positive, you know, my positive vibes and energy heading to the Walton family. I don't do the praying thing, so it's uh, kind of okay. just redundant for me to say thoughts and prayers of sorts. But, yeah. you know, hopefully they can find peace at this time. Death is always hard. So. Yeah. So, first up, we'll do King and Queen of the Ring, since that was the first show of the weekend. Solid show. Uh, only six matches, which six matches on the card, which seems to be a, a a common thing with WWE these days, unless it's one of the big five. On the pre-show, we had the women's tag team champions Bianca Belair and Jade Cargill defend their championships against Candice LeRae and Indy Hartwell successfully. This match was made official on the Go Home episode of SmackDown due to Candice LeRae injuring Bianca Belair's knee uh, in the first round of the Queen of the Ring tournament. And Indy finally uh, taking uh, taking to this whole new heel persona, which... Looks kind of weird. I never thought I'd see Ken, uh, Indy turn heel, but here we are. I, I'm actually enjoying this Candice LeRae, Indy Hartwell heel run. I wish the crowds were a little more invested in it. Um, I don't know what it is, or why they can't seem to relate to it, or why there's just not really much of a pull. The American crowds specifically are just dead um, for the most part when these two are out there, and, and I don't really understand it. I don't know if that's just because there's a lack of really strong face presence for them to be able to build slowly and then work their way into like a Bianca Belair. Um, but, you know, I'm enjoying it. I think it's great. I think it's good for Candice. I think it's good for Indy. It's fresh uh, for them. And uh, hopefully it catches on and they keep they keep just trying to stick with it and see what happens. And, and they don't give up on it too soon because that tends to be a thing. Or it was a thing under the Vince McMahon era. So. Yeah, yeah. So, yeah, again, uh, Bianca's knee played a part in this whole match. You could tell it was uh, really bothering her. Um, luckily enough, they they retained, but, yeah, there's... Of the... Pretty much just a throwaway match in my eyes, but... Yeah, I don't think yeah. Candice and Indy were going to win. I don't think anybody was expecting them to be booked to win in that sense, or anything along those lines. It was just more uh, uh, good exposure for both of them. And I thought the match was decent. You know, I don't think it was, like, great or anything. It wasn't a trailblazing match, but I thought it was decent enough, entertaining enough. Um, you could see Jade's improvement. She's getting a little more confidence with each outing, which is, you know, awesome to see for her from her perspective. Um, so th- as long as she continues to grow in that role, I think uh, Indy and Candice are a good first, you know, one two because they're pretty safe in the ring and they're and they're pretty good technically sound in the ring. So yeah, yeah. Well, when we're we're heading towards uh, the uh, them facing Zoe Stark and the uh, 
Shayna Baszler at some point. Wouldn't be wouldn't surprise you that it was at a Clash the Castle next month. But I mean, at this point, that's the direction it seems like we're going on Raw. Mm-hmm. So yeah, that that which I think should be a decent match. But we'll get to that when it's time for Clash of the Castle. But now to kick off the main show, we got. Uh, Becky Lynch uh, defending her Women's World Championship against Liv Morgan, which Liv Morgan surprisingly won. Uh, I I had, I yeah, this was probably the worst match on the main card in my eyes. Uh, there was, I mean, the, the stories there with the whole Liv Morgan Dirty Dom thing, which was further pushed on Raw this week, but. Yeah, that without Rhea Ripley being there, I thought there was was a poor decision with uh, Liv Morgan uh, winning. But yeah, I didn't I didn't really put two and two together uh, going in. I picked Becky to win, thinking that uh, it was going to be Raw the following night that she was going to lose it. Um, but I wasn't thinking about the aspect of it would probably would have been better to send her off on Raw, um, you know, losing a rematch than it was losing the title, uh, primarily because of her contract situation. You know, there's yeah. a lot of talk surrounding her contract. I don't think she's going anywhere. I think she's going to resign in WWE. I think they're giving her time off uh, to be with the family while Seth rehabs because Seth isn't there right now. So I think she wants yeah. to be home. So I think Liv is is the is the right choice. And I didn't have a problem with the match leading up until the ending. The ending was yeah. so utterly confusing to me in a sense of there's only one plausible ending for this storyline now, and that is Dirty Dom turning on Rhea. Because why do you come out in that spot? It's not like Liv had Becky and Hard hard shape. It was Becky had Liv in the disarmor at the time. Yeah. So why do you come out at that moment if you're trying to prevent Liv from winning the championship? Right? So automatically the timing is suspicious because you're looking at it going, well, what, that doesn't make any sense. Like and now you've cornered yourself storyline-wise into only one situation and that can be Dom abandoning Rhea for Liv. Because, because it doesn't make sense otherwise. Yeah. No, that, I, I, I'm sure you've seen all the rumors and whatnot, but that's the path that they were planning on going anyway for the last month or two. But Yeah, which yeah, is they, fine if, the, if you believe the rumors. It's just you've made it a little too obvious at this point. You know? Yeah, yeah. It kind of sucks the emotional aspect out of it. Yeah, yeah. Uh but hopefully Trips is smart enough to bring everyone back into the story. But because yeah, he even got involved on the in the match on Raw, right, uh, and which ended up costing Becky, right. And again, it was another one of those situations where it was like it, it you're almost making it so you only have one direction to go in this situation. Um, you could try to play it off like it was a mistake all you want, but you come out at the most inopportune time. Now, granted, you could play it off that Dom is painted as an idiot, and because that's what, you know, has pretty much happened, is that he's kind of painted as this moron who's always doing poor timing, poor decisions, whatever it may be. But uh, just from a storyline perspective with logic involved, (laughs) you've painted yourself into a corner. So. Yeah, yeah. So... And next match on the pay per view was the Intercontinental, Intercontinental Championship match. Uh, Sami Zayn defeating Chad Gable and Bronson Reed. Now the big take from this was the Chad Gable heel turn, degrading the Alpha Academy. Because uh, Otis was out there and he tried his best to get uh, Chad Gable tried his guess best to get Otis involved. Uh, which end up backfiring from a 
uh, Sami Zayn moving out of the way to and Otis clotheslining Chad Gable, which I found kind of hilarious. But I, I kind of had a feeling that's where it was going, anyways, when Otis yeah. came to ringside. I feel bad for Otis, and I feel bad for you know. Um, uh, why am I drawing a blank on his name? Who's the other one that's there with him in the Alpha Academy? Um, Akira Tozawa? Not Tozawa. Uh, I wanted to call him Yoshi Tatsu, and I knew that wasn't right, because Yoshi was <laughs> years ago. Uh, Tozawa. Yeah. Uh, I feel bad for both of them, because really the most relevant stuff that they have been doing lately has been with the Alpha Academy, and this feels like it's leading to Chad Gable and the Creed Brothers becoming a stable. Um, but it's more going to leave Otis kind of meandering and, and lost, not really sure what to do. Um, you know, and, and Tosawa has been kind of a, a little bit of a comical relief, you know, character for the most part anyway. So he'll probably be relegated back to that once the, once the Alpha Academy dies. But th- this is just leading to Gable and, and the Creed brothers becoming a thing. And, uh, I'm all for that. I think that's a great pairing. Um, so I wasn't really surprised to see Otis. It will probably be a TV feud between Gable and Otis for, you know, a little bit. And then, you know, Otis may have to be repackaged and then brought back out. But um, we'll see what happens with that storyline. Maybe he gets back, goes back to NXT for a little bit and gets hot down there. So. <clears throat> yeah, but I mean, the thing is that he's been in this uh, comedy role for far too long on Seeing him in a serious role be a bit off, at least for a month or two. But I like Otis. I think Otis is actually, for yeah. a big man, is actually pretty good in the ring. Like I think he's actually really, yeah. really solid, and he's got some. I, I, I'm, I, I'm also wondering though if it might be a little bit of like a health thing. Maybe they're trying to ask him to lose a little bit, a little bit of weight. Maybe not like a ton, but maybe like you know, hey, drop a little bit of weight and. It will give you a serious run, kind of like what they did with Gunther, uh, you know, yeah. that type of situation. Maybe not to Gunther's level, obviously, but um, because, you know, he, he he's likable. He, he's, yeah. he's charismatic. Like, their fans do relate to him. It's just he, he's not going to be a superstar that's going to lead win, win a, you know, lead the company in the, in the world title run. But you could build him to a point to maybe have at least one run at like a three month window as a monster heel. Right, like he's yeah. one of those guys, you know. He's never he, he's never going to be a guy who's going to carry the company for months and on months on months on months. But you could probably plug him in somewhere and, and give him, uh, you know, as a monster heel or even a legit threat on on as a face with with, with his you know charisma. But that that that's long term. That's not. I'm not thinking like right now. Right now, they just need to figure out what they want to do with him first. Yeah, well, I'm sure they'll figure something out. Uh, so next up, we got the Queen of the Ring tournament final, and it was announced during the um, the conference, the the kickoff conference thing that mm-hmm. the winner of the King and the Queen of the Ring and the, the the Queen of the Ring and the King of the Ring will both receive a world championship of the brand that the winner is on. So we got the Queen of the Ring final. Uh, where Nia Jax defeated Lyra Valkyrie, the Valkyria, receiving a shot against Bailey, or if Bailey's still a champion at SummerSlam, but they're getting a, a women's championship match at SummerSlam. Now, for a Nia Jax match, this was pretty, pretty fucking good. No, I'm not yeah, the I... biggest Nia. I'm not the biggest Nia Jax fan, but for a Nia match, this was yeah, pretty good. And, I'm becoming a Lyra Valkyria fan. Yeah, I, I thought it was too soon for Lyra Valkyria to win. I thought that this tournament was always going to be designed for Nia Jax. I think it's perfect, um, to be honest with you. And, and, and first, I want to give a shout-out to Trips for finally making the King Green of the Ring worth something um, yeah. again. Hopefully, we get this as a yearly thing instead of a bi-yearly thing, and uh, you know they, they stick with it and make it the... Uh, the staple to find out who your SummerSlam opponent is because I feel like it's a huge missed opportunity otherwise. So hopefully they, they stick with it and that becomes the, you know, the staple moving forward. Um, but 
Yeah, th- this one, this match was actually really, really good. Lyra Valkyria is so good. Um, I don't think a lot of people realize how good she really is and how truly she could become. So it's good to see her get a little bit of a push like that on the main stage and um, put on a fairly solid match with Nia Jax, because I'm not a big Nia Jax fan either. Uh, but I thought the match was actually pretty good, and um, that ending was really kind of really super creative. So I thought that was pretty neat too. So uh, good, good for them. And, uh, you know, well, we'll, uh, we'll see what happens moving forward. But I thought that was actually uh, a good match across the board. Yeah. yeah. Now for the, what, one of the two best matches on the card of the whole show, minus the, the ending, was uh, the King of the Ring tournament final, where Gunther defeated Randy Orton to get a shot at the World Heavyweight Championship. Now, the only problem I had with this match is Randy Orton's shoulders weren't on the mat, and one of his shoulders went on the mat. That's the only takeaway I have from this, or only only negative I take I've got for this match. But other than that, this was a top notch match. Yeah, the, these two should wrestle all the time. Um, yeah, it, you know, basically, basically, the the shoulder not being down, I think, may turn into a storyline um, because Corey. WWE is so good at improvising, and yeah, they're yeah. so good at they're so good at taking something that may have been by accident and making it seem like it was done on purpose. And this was definitely clearly an accident without context, right? If you just saw it, you'd just be like, "That was a mistake." They should have just, you know, they just didn't catch it. Um, but because they're so good at the gorilla position, whether it's Trips or whoever's in there, uh, basically told the Corey, "Hey, point out that." the shoulder may not have been down and talk about wanting to see that from a different angle. Um, because you could tell that he, when he said it, that it wasn't something that uh, was naturally supposed to be said originally. Right. Yeah. It, but Corey's just so good and he's learned from the best, in my opinion, Michael Cole. So it's really like made, you know, a smooth transition for the two of them as play by play to be able to handle that. Right. So, uh, I, I think they're going to turn it into a storyline. We'll, you know, we'll we'll see what happens tomorrow on SmackDown. But um, yeah, as far as the results are concerned, this is perfect for Gunther. It, it's exactly yeah. what he, it's exactly what he's going to need. Um, <clears throat> there's there's some uh, some questions surrounding the championship, though, moving forward uh, into SummerSlam. And uh, we can touch base on that a little bit later if you want, but uh, yeah. primarily it just revolves around Clash of the Champions and what uh, Clash of the Castle and what they're going to do. Yeah, yeah. But yeah, because uh, apparently, uh, from what I've, I don't know if it's, gonna, if it's true or not, or just people just playing up because of that shoulder bit, but Orton and Gunther might be facing at the uh, Clash of the Castle, which would be a if it does, it would be another great match, but yeah. I just don't know if they're going to do the, a cross-brand. I don't know if they're just going to yeah, do a no. cross-brand match like that. That's all. Yeah. Yeah. Now, the main event of the show is Cody Rhodes defending his WWE Championship against Logan Paul. And I thought this match was... Uh, Pretty good as well. And Logan Paul, every match always finds a way to impress everyone. He's he's taken to WWE seamlessly. I mean, we 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 now in the age where celebrity uh, outsiders are putting on are actually putting on decent matches. So, uh, so yeah, Cody uh, retained, but yeah. Logan is has been impressive. It, it, it's just that Logan is so, so such a natural, right? Yeah. Like even when even when he's playing a heel or or you know being booed as a heel, it's a natural feel. And when he and when he came in, he was with uh you know he was being you know who was being booked as a face, and uh, even that even though he was still being booed because people didn't think he belonged. 
um, you know, he, he was so natural in that role too. It's almost just like anything that they have thrown at him, he's just been a natural at for the most part. So, um, I think that this heel run in the fact that he's having matches and he's producing really good matches and he's there full time now has really kind of, I think the universe is warming up to the WWE universe is warming up to him. Like as far as him being a legit individual, I mean, it's just so natural. Everything that he's done, um, he's put on a lot of really great matches with people, you know, his match with Roman Reigns at, at, uh, crown jewel was fantastic last year. And, um, you know, this match here with Cody was really, really good. Uh, I think this was the second best match on the card. I think the Gunther Orton match was the best one of the night. But, yeah. um, you know, it just it just goes to show that they, they have something with Logan Paul. And uh, they know what they're doing with him. And that's pretty much all you can ask for, right? I mean, even uh, <clears throat> Logan's worst match was still pretty good. Yeah. In his, in his run of matches that he's had, but... Yeah, uh, but yeah, I agree. This was the second best match of the show. Um, I could, I could, well, I could watch Cody and Logan face off multiple times as well, have a bit of a series going along. But we got I reckon one of them will have to drop the drop their titles first before they do that again. So yeah, that was. Uh, King and Queen of the Ring. Uh, hopefully, I get, I, like you said, I hope this is a yearly thing. But, yeah, there's a... Yeah. Now, Double or Nothing. Did you end up watching Double or Nothing, or...? I, I caught some of it. I haven't finished watching it all, but I know I know all the results, and right. I, I've seen highlights and, and, you know, clips and stuff here and there, but... I mean, overall, it's it's a typical AEW show for the most part. Yeah, like, yeah. There, there wasn't anything that was like, oh my god, you know. Yeah, no, there's. So the you had two matches on the pre-show. First, that was Deanna Perazzo and Thunder Rosa. This rivalry confuses the fuck out of me. <laughs> I mean, the the basic this whole thing on. Thunder Rosa wanted to face fucking what's her name? Tony Storm by herself without help. Deanna Prize wanted to help and then she didn't like that. Thunder Rosa didn't want the help and no idea who the face is, no idea who the heel is. I haven't really established that properly. The only thing I can get out of this is that Deanna's the heel, but that's not fully established, but I mean, it was still a decent match, but yeah, it's a I, clusterfuck. It, it's, it's typical AEW booking. Uh, the, the idea of some of these storylines and where they go and, and why there's certain matches and 90% of the time, it doesn't even make any friggin' sense. So I, I'm just as confused as you are. I don't understand why these two were in a storyline when you brought Deanna Perrazzo in to immediately push for the world title, the, the women's title. You gave her a couple matches and then all of a sudden you just relegated her to a a feud with Thunder Rosa that makes zero friggin' sense. Like that's the issue with <clears throat> that's the issue with I have with AEW and their booking is like everybody has a chance at a world title match and then when they're actually involved in a mid card feud nobody gives a shit because it's like oh she'll just get a match in like three months anyways so yeah and it's just like the uh, other pre-show match no fucking context uh, which was uh, the acclaimed facing Cage of Agony which is uh, Brian Cage Toa Leona and Bishop Korn no, I've got no, no idea why they face each other outside no. of uh, Max Caster not knowing the names of Toa Leona and Bishop Corn. That was the only uh, thing I got out of this whole storyline. I mean, to be honest with you, I don't think anybody knew their names other than uh, you know the people that actually pay attention. You know, they were always the Gates of Agony. Nobody know nobody knew who the hell they were. Like they're on ROH. Unless you watch ROH, you're not going to know their names. So, like, yeah. 
I mean, I, I, but, I don't know. It's just it's AEW booking, man. It's so un, yeah. it's so unpredictable. It's hard to really understand it all. Yeah, I mean, it, don't get me wrong. It was still a decent match. I mean, and credit to Billy Gunn. That motherfucker's sixty-one years old. He's still yeah. moving around like he's in his mid-thirties. Yep. He's he's two years older than the Undertaker, and he's still putting on decent matches. He's he is in better shape now than he was back when he was in his prime, and I think primarily the reason that is is because I feel like he's doing it right. Like I don't know if he's linked up with DDP or not. But whatever it is that that he is doing, he is doing it right. Whereas back then, I feel like it was just a lot of it was manufactured, right? Yeah. I feel like he's just doing it right now, um, and taking care of his body and whatnot. But he he's in really great shape. He's still putting on good matches, and uh, he, he still proves he's he's got it. I just don't know how much longer he's really got left, though. Overall, yeah, he's in better shape than his sons who are in their twenties. <laughs> I don't know, I think Austin and Colton are in pretty good shape. Yeah, yeah. So the first match of the main card was the AEW International Championship match. Uh, Roderick Strong with the Undisputed Kingdom taking on Will Ospreay, which Will Ospreay won. Yeah, but... Let, let, the writing was on the wall as soon as this match was made anyways. I mean, Roderick was done as the international champion. It was going to be... Um, but I want to talk a little bit about what you said a minute ago with why the acclaimed and whatever were in this match. The matches AEW put on are fantastic. Week in and week out, yeah. they put on great in-ring quality. It's just the rest yeah. of it doesn't make sense. It's like you only have a a piece of the puzzle. And honestly speaking, as far as pro wrestling is concerned, it's the least important piece of professional wrestling. Um, yeah. But they, their match quality is sensational. I thought Roderick Strong and Will Ospreay, this is one of the matches I did catch. I thought they, they were fantastic. I mean, Ospreay is fantastic in the ring. Everybody knows how good he is in the ring. It's just, is there context of what he's doing and is he just doing moves for the sake of doing moves? Like, is there a story to being told in the ring? You know, it's simple stuff like that that a lot of people don't realize actually connect with the crowd. You know, I was saying that to a mate of mine the other day. We were watching uh, one of the AEW's TV shows. You know, that WWE focus on the story and saying, here's a match, here's why you should be watching this match. Here's why you should care about this match. AEW put on, they cater to the hardcore fan, then they'll watch just about anything. Mm. But they they don't tell you why you should care about this match. The only thing about this match, that if it, well, for the casual fans, the only thing that people would really care about this match is it's a title match. Right. If it was but, a title that people cared about. Yeah, but outside of that, it's like, why is Will Ospreay facing Roderick Strong? I mean, I think it was a tournament or some shit, I don't remember. Well, it's also the fact that they signed Will Ospreay, they hyped him up to be this, you know, the next face, the next whatever major star of AEW. AEW stands think that his signing with AEW is more important than than um, Drew McIntyre re-signing with WWE, which is hilarious in its own right. Um, yeah. But it's like, why is he... Like, I get you will probably want to put a mid-card title on him first, but why is it the international title and not the TBS title? You know what I mean? Because or the... Uh, yeah, not the TNT. TBS title, the uh, TNT title, yeah. Like, <clears throat> why why wouldn't you put him in a, in a, in a bigger feud... Then with Roderick Strong, and nothing against Roderick Strong by any means, but he's not Adam Copeland. No. You know? Yeah, well, my only thought was that they don't want to put a face versus face in a title match straight away. But isn't Osprey which... part of the Don Callis family? Yeah, but like... he's also... <laughs> I mean, 
Yes, he is, but oh. he's, he's like, there's a Don Callis family, there are a bunch of heels, and you got Will Ospreay, who's part of that, but he's also the outsider. That's the way I see it anyway. He's, he's, he's the face of the group, whereas uh, all the others are heels. I think Tony Khan needs to learn how to book. That too. <laughs> I I hate being so critical of them because I really want them to succeed, but it is so freaking confusing. Like if you're if you, casual fans, like look, let's face it, hardcore fans are great to have. You always have to have your hardcore fans. You have to have them as as a base, right? You have to start yeah. somewhere. But your casual yeah. fan is the fan that's going to make you the most money. Your casual fan is the one that's going to be. Okay, you're in town. Let's bring you. Let, let's bring all your family. Oh, I have kids. Let's watch this. I don't really. I don't really care as much as my kids do, but I'm going to watch it with them anyway. It's your casual fan because that's where it grows, right? That's the majority of what your fans are. If you take a look at WWE, I guarantee their fan base is probably seventy-five, twenty-five casuals. That I, w- I would say roughly. Then that might be yeah. aggressive or it might be conservative, but I'd say seventy-five, twenty-five casuals. AEW doesn't know how to reach to the casual fan, and this is part of it. Osprey's coming out with these guys that just did some bad things, but here he is being cheered over here in this match against Roderick Strong. Is he a face? Is he a heel? You know, like what is it? What is he doing? And and I think that that's where the lines are being too crossed up for them to be able to continue to build major stars. Yeah, I had a mate around watching to watch uh, Dynasty last month and because he's he's watched plenty of wwe shows and that that's he's not, he's not much of a wrestling fan but he's he knows wwe if you show him wwe wrestlers he'll, he'll probably they'll name 50 percent of them yep. and he watching dynasty and he was confused as to why the rep no, it was a normal watching i forgot what match we were watching but it was a just a normal one full yeah, typical match, typical mm-hmm. singles match. He was confused as to why the ref wasn't counting the wrestlers out when they were outside the ring. He was confused as to why they were letting them do whatever the fuck they wanted. And when in WWE, the, they count when they're outside the ring. They, the referee's on top of everything, controlling the t- the pace as a referee's supposed to do. But yeah, the ref in, the referees in AW are just letting the wrestlers do whatever the fuck. It's the difference between putting on a match with moves and putting on a match that tells a story. Yeah. That, that's really the difference. Pretty much. I mean, but yeah. Yeah. But no, Sorry, I got, got a little off track there, but yeah. Osprey struck that yeah. chord with me. And what you had said on the yeah. pre-show was the matches are always great. They're always put on really good matches. I mean, it's some of the best quality in ring it's just why 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 should I tune in? I can catch this later on on like Twitter or something. Like, why do I need to tune in to see it? You know. Um, yeah. So. Now I can just about guarantee that Dave Mills has already given this at least six stars just because we <laughs> lost Brace when booked. I mean, me and I mate joke about that all the time with every Will Osprey match. What's Dave Mills gonna rate it this week? Well, without the match even starting, it's already six stars because Will Osprey's been booked. Where it it's, goes from there. It starts out as a 10-star match before it's even put on, but he may take a star away here and there, but it still ends up higher than five every single time. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> we, so now we go from one former New Japan wrestler to another former New Japan wrestler. With the Bang Bang Gang taking on Death Triangle, which is, so, Jay White, Austin Gunn, and Colton Gunn, Dickon Puck, Penta, El Zero Miedo, and Ray Phoenix for the Unified World Trails Championship. Uh, this match was... Oh, I didn't mind this match. It wasn't the best match on the card. It was far from, but it was your typical AEW Trios match. Yeah, I mean... This one was actually... There- no, sorry, go ahead. This is one of the few that actually had a story to it, which was a uh, puck wanting, puck wanting a challenge. Yeah, even that storyline still a little of a, you know, it's kind of a, you know, 
very thin in the sense of like how to get people to care about it. But I will say um, it, it was a typical, typical six man tag match AEW style. It's not one of those matches that stood out, but it's not one of those matches that, you know, you're like, Oh my God, I can't believe I sat through that and watched that. I will say that Jay White carrying Sting's bat and Darby Allen doing nothing about it is actually kind of stupid. Um, yeah. Like it, it doesn't really make any sense to why Jay White's still carrying the bat around, but you know, whatever. <clears throat> yeah. I love it for Jay White because I, I think that they did him really, really poorly with the whole MJF feud. Um, so I'm glad that at least he still has, you know, titles around his waist, but, uh, rebuilding him as a single star is going to be much harder. Yeah. Speaking of MJF, I forgot to mention that between the international championship match and the world trade championship match, MJF returned. Uh, had- they kind of half teased that was because, uh, Adam Cole came out with a devil's mask cut, the typical Adam Cole promo, nothing special, nothing worth remembering. Then MJF comes out, teases a uh, reunion between the two, and he ends up kicking Adam Cole in the balls and cutting the whole, I'm staying with AEW because I don't want WWE. The whole thing sounded like it was a whole, WWE doesn't want me, so I'm staying here because I know I'll get paid. And he looked like the cheapest rip-off of Triple H, uh, circa... 2002 Royal Rumble return with the denim jacket and the heavy tan and whatnot. That I swear that motherfucker was more orange than fucking Donald Trump on a good day. I, uh, I, I, this has been the typical AEW promo recently. It's been, I love AEW. AEW is great. AEW this, like, uh, I mean, I get that we're supposed to try to think that there's, like, a war going on between AEW and, and the, the Elite right now, and, you know, there's supposed rumors that MJF asked WWE to make him one of the highest paid wrestlers in the business, and, I mean, I don't really see MJF ever really painting himself into a corner like that, um, because you haven't done it in the WWE level. Sure, you did it at the AEW level. You haven't done it at the WWE level, so... Uh, and MJF always strikes me as a person that's sort of off camera is pretty humble. He's a pretty good dude, like a pretty, you know, like it's everything that he's ever wanted, but he doesn't really strike me as a guy who thinks he's worth more than what he really is. You know, like he, yeah. he knows he's great at what he does, but he's not one of those guys that goes around, you know, off camera and expects that to be that the case. So um, I don't know. Maybe they just couldn't come to a contract agreement. Maybe it was just never really the case. Maybe WWE never really reached out. Who the hell knows? Um, yeah. But I don't know if there's a worse tattoo in wrestling right now than that one. Yeah, <laughs> no. Because I can guarantee if he went to WWE with that tattoo on him, he, it'll get blurred or they'll keep it covered up somehow. I, I don't know. They They mentioned AEW on NXT, though. Yeah, I heard about that with uh, Ethan yeah. Page showing up. Yeah. So, so I don't know. WWE seems to be a little more willing to at least acknowledge stuff, so that's good at least. Oh, well, they're working with TNA and mentioning TNA quite regularly with Jordan Grace getting the title shot at uh, Battlegrounds. So I think that's fantastic. <clears throat> I think that yeah. I think that working relationship is amazing. It, yeah, I agree. So. Oh, well, just I'm curious to see uh, as to who WWE send out to TNA to work a couple matches since it, at the moment it seems pretty one sided. But but I mean, it, watch TNA. but it's not really one sided though when it comes to the idea of the exposure TNA is giving. Yeah, yeah. You know what I mean? Like you're you're using a platform that's much bigger than the one that you have to get your stars on there, or at least one of your stars on there on a pretty consistent basis that's carrying your title with your name, um, you know, type of situation. So it, it's not really a, uh, I don't think it's really as much of a need on the, on the other side, uh, as much as it is for TNA just to be able to get their name to, to a larger audience. Yeah. Yeah. 
So, speaking of uh, Women's World Championships, uh, we have Timeless Tony Storm taking on Serena Deep, in which Timeless Tony Storm uh, retained. This wasn't a horrible match. I actually enjoyed I enjoyed this match because I'm a Tony Storm fan, but so I might be a little biased there, but it was still a pretty solid match. Although I don't really see Serena Day being Women's World Champion anytime soon. My my issue is is I I just I don't know I don't care enough about Serena Deeb's storyline. You know, like like we talked about before. You know, we talked about before uh, with you and how like she you forgot that she was even there. Like yeah. she got hurt and you forgot she was there. Uh, and I'm glad that she's coming, that she's back because I do appreciate her in the ring. But I, you know, I I don't relate to her prom any of her promos leading up to this match. I didn't care about anything that she had to say. Um, I I don't like the storyline of oh I'm back from injury. I deserve a world women's world title shot. It just it really and that's how this one felt. Uh, yeah. You know, I this is not a match that I watched because again, this was not one that I really cared about. I knew Tony Storm was probably going to win because I didn't see Serena taking it. So, uh, yeah, I mean, good for Tony. This Storm, this gimmick is one of the best gimmicks that WWE's done in a long time. Uh, I, I love the the little snippets. I think they're great personally. Yeah. So, uh, I'm glad that she's still the women's champ though. If any, uh, the way I see it is I see Mariah May ending Tony Storm's reign uh, at some point in the future. I'm not sure when, but I re- I reckon it's with Mariah May that ends up taking the the championship. But... Yeah, I think I think I think it could end up being Mariah May as well. But I, I just I feel like it's almost like they're waiting for Britt Baker to come back. Yeah. Well, that's another name of I kind of half forgot about as well. And she was supposed to be the women's division. Well, she, she was the women's division for a good chunk of time before she got injured. Her and Jamie Hayter. But, yeah. So next up, we have Orange Cassidy defeating Tramp Beretta. And Orange Cassidy came out in his old theme music which I thought was amazing. Uh, but, yeah, this this was probably the one of the few story, uh, matches with a, the story, with a story worth investing in, <laughs> given the history between Orange Cassidy and Trent Beretta. I, I love the story, but, but the writing, I love the story, but the writing was on the wall. Yeah, this was one of those matches where uh, Trent probably should have been booked to win, and they booked Orange to win because it's just Tony Khan and the way that they uh, Tony Khan does things. That's all there was to it. I I didn't expect Orange to lose this match. Uh, He probably should have because that's how you build people, Uh, especially you know a guy like Trent Beretta who's you know always been a really solid worker, always been a company guy, never complains, you know, at least on social media from that standpoint. Yeah. Um, so, you know, they, they probably should have done him a solid and let him beat Orange Cassidy in this one, but I, I just never saw a world where, where you know, he was going to. So Yeah, then uh, he ended up joining the Don Callis family this week as well on, on, yes. uh, on Dynamite after Don offered... Cassidy the uh, contract, but yeah. So next up, we got the FTW rules match for the FTW Championship. Jericho defeated the uh, Hook and Katsuyori Shibata, in which uh, Brian Keith was also involved towards the end. Because uh, uh, oh, Hook and Shibata. Uh, defeated Brian Keith by a double tap out to get into this match. Brian Keith didn't like that 
he told Jericho early in the show, this isn't the last you've seen of me. And yeah, he ended up uh, coming out in a luchador mask and attacking uh, Hook and Shibata to help Jericho retain. It was your typical FTW match, really. Uh, Jericho pinned Shibata with, to win with a, a steel trash can over him to to win. It, yeah, I, I don't have I don't have much to say about this one. I, I I it's time for Jericho. Unlike Billy Gunn, he's not. It's just not. His matches are. It was it was time for Jericho to leave six <sighs> years ago. Yeah, I I just I don't know. I, it, it this title is another one of those titles that I don't really give a damn about. It's kind of a made up title that they for some reason felt like they should stick it and just let it stick and um. You know, Hook going through this grueling match and, you know, this, 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 and then, you know, body slamming, body, you know, security guards left and right after, like, less than 30 seconds afterwards. Yeah. It's not believable from Hook. He's too small. That That's one of the biggest issues yeah. is it's not a believable, it, it's just not a believable gimmick that he can just go in there and wreck people. It's just, it's not believable. So, um, yeah. it's hard, it's hard to rally behind him for that reason. Yeah, I mean, oh, the FTW Championship has been around in AEW longer than it was in ECW, mm-hmm. which is goes against what the title. If the title was nothing like what it was in ECW, no, because it, it, it fit ECW's mantra. But yep, I don't know. At, at this point, AEW is just ECW with money. Basically, so, never, never a truer statement than when we get to the anarchy in the arena match. <laughs> that, that's for sure. <laughs> exactly. Uh, so next up, we got a uh, the an IWGP World Heavyweight Champion World Heavyweight Championship Eliminator match between John Moxley and Konsuke Takeshita. Had to catch the one he would have got in the future uh, IWGP World Heavyweight Championship match. Mox won. I was actually shocked by that. I was yeah. actually surprised by that outcome. I thought for sure that that New Japan, uh, you know, would want Takeshka to be uh, involved in that title in the future. So I thought they would call the shot to have Takeshka win that match because it wasn't for the title. Because we yeah. had discussed last the last podcast about how New Japan doesn't like having you know two title matches or whatever like that in in, in a short period of time, um, so I, I was actually a little bit surprised that they had Mox win this match. I, I did not, I did not expect that from from New Japan or AEW for that matter to 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 eliminate Takeshka like that. Um, I'm assuming that that's only while Mox holds the title. Right. Yeah. Yeah. So he had, a, he, he had another eliminator match on Dynamite this week as well. So right. So I just I'm just really surprised. It was not something that I was expecting to see. I was actually thought Takeshka was going to take that one. Good match, by the yeah. way. Yeah. Yeah. Takeshka is a star. It's just I don't think AEW knows how to do anything uh, with him. To the surprise of nobody. Or what to do with them. So I know, right? Yeah. <laughs> to the surprise of nobody. <clears throat> so yeah. Well, n- next up we have uh, Adam Copeland defending the TNT Championship against Malachi Black. In the cage and, match that wasn't a cage match. Yeah. The yeah, yeah the barbed wire steel <laughs> cage match. Yeah. That, that wasn't remember, a steel cage match. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, how AEW do still case matches has got me beat. And they go in and out of the case like there's no fucking tomorrow. But. Yeah, it doesn't make any sense to me. Yeah. And yeah, Adam Kaplan went full brood going into the in his entrance. Even had the brood across the 
the Titan Tron, which I'm surprised AEW got away with since, as far as everyone knows, that is aware, the brood is WWE. Uh, depends if it's copyrighted still or not. Yeah. Depends if they held. Depends if they held that copyright still or not. They may yeah. not have. Copeland may have bought it. So, or Gangrel may have bought it. Yeah. So speaking of Gangrel, he made an appearance during this match as well. Comes in and destroys three stars, and then just walks off like it was nothing. I, I don't. I, yeah. I, it's not believable. It's not believable. Like, yes, it's a it's a nostalgic pop, but Malachi Black, Brody King, and Buddy Murphy. So, fall victim to Gangrel? Gangrel wasn't yeah. even that big of a star in WWE. Like, don't get me wrong, <laughs> I love the nostalgia fact of it, but Gangrel's a minion compared to what Adam Copeland was doing in WWE. Pretty much, yeah. <laughs> you know, like, like, that would be like Farouk yeah. coming back to help The Rock dominate. Like, it, it's not, that's just, like, Farouk, as good as he was, He's not on Rock's level, so it's like no. it's not believable, <laughs> you know. To be to be fair, not too many people are on the Rock's level to begin with. Well, at, right. At I, I'm just, point. Yeah, I was just using it as an example of like, yeah, the, yeah. You know what I mean? Like, I just I yeah, don't know. Yeah, it's hard. But yeah, it's, it's hard. But yeah, had so yeah, the match ended by a referee stoppage. Uh, had Copeland lost, he would have had to take the knee and. Join House of Black, and during the match, he ended up breaking his leg. Or his, oh. he broke his uh, tibia. Uh, it's been the Stellar Tales, his ankle, so the, the lower part of the tibia in the ankle that end up that end up breaking. Apparently, he'll be out for four to six months with surgery. So he won the match, and he's now no longer TNT champion. In the dumbest spot in the world, I don't know why yeah. you're doing that. That's because... a holy shit moment. They all want the holy shit moment. Holy shit! That's yeah. all they want. Like, it's not about and safety. A lot, yeah, a lot of the and Adams of that age where holy shit moments aren't required. I mean, he's he's already an established name in right. the world of pro wrestling. Yeah, he doesn't need holy shit moments. At all to get people to like him because he's going to get cheered or booed, whatever he wants to, however he wants. So, all right, cope, gonna cope, I guess. I get well, get well, man. I mean, I, I have no doubt that you're probably having some of the most fun ever in your life, but at the same time, like. Yeah, get well. <laughs> Just get is, well. I don't think having fun is worth that much pain. No. So, but yeah, hopefully he gets well and recovers soon. But unless he changes his name to John Cena, I don't think he's going to be back before that four months is up. Probably not. <laughs> I don't even think John Cena at that age would be able to return as early as everybody would expect him to. Yeah. Even with as good a shape as he's in, I just don't think so at that age. That's a, yeah. that's a that's quite a recovery for an age, somebody that age. So pretty much, yeah. So yeah. So next up we got um Mercedes Monet defeating Willie Nightingale to win the TBS championship. Nah, Can't I, say I'm surprised that Mercedes won. Mercedes got that ego. I know that she thinks she's the face of women's wrestling around the world. So, oh, well. <laughs> yeah, I'm, I'm sorry. Yeah, but she's the, not. the the one, th- yeah, yeah. The only the the only bright spot of this whole match is uh, uh Hathaway and Stat turning on Willow Nightingale. That's the only takeaway from this match that's really worth talking about. And uh, Stack gave her reasons on on Dynamite this week. She 
sick of people saying they're doing shit and thinking, well, stat will be there to fix everything up. So, the only thing is, this was probably the only thing that no one, no one saw this coming. There was no, because that uh, Statlanders, Statlanders, then? yeah, Statlander turning. Oh, oh, yeah, oh. yeah, there was no, there was no pre prelude to it. Again, it's uh, yeah. that WWE, uh, the AEW booking. Like, there's just no rhyme or reason for why they do stuff. It just happens. You know, the, the the result of this match wasn't unexpected. Everybody knew that this was no, going to yeah, be the yeah. case. Yeah. Uh, but it, it's another match that I didn't really care about because, I mean, this is nepotism 101 or being handed silver platter stuff. Killing a young, killing a rising star in the women's division, let's be honest. I mean, Willow yeah. is rising in popularity, you know, and now you just automatically kill her momentum for, you know, the greatest women's wrestler in the world who hadn't wrestled a match in uh, AEW yet, so that's awesome. Good job. Yeah, well, I found it funny where leading up to this match, she was all AEW, where the best wrestle. She hadn't even wrestled a match yet. <sighs> Sorry, what does that say about her? But. So, now we got the second of AEW's triple main events. Swerve Strickland defending the AEW World Championship against Christian Cage. And, yeah, this was Christian Cage taking a whole bunch of time off and coming back to get a World Championship match. Another weird... I don't know. I I felt like this feud took a backseat. It's your world champion. Treat him like a world champion, for Christ's sakes. Like, it's not hard, you know? Yeah, I mean, Swerve's been screwed around ever since he lost against fucking uh, Hangman Page. Since that feud, he's, Swerve's just been an afterthought in the main event. Which is so weird to make the call to put the title on him, because... You're still treating them like an afterthought. It's so weird to me. They literally treated this matchup like it was like the fourth most important matchup on the card. Like, Swerve deserves better. The world title deserves better. Christian K... And it's not even the feud with Christian, because Christian is at the hottest streak of his life right now. It's just... They didn't treat it like it was. You know, Christian came back and they were like, oh, here's a world title match. Let's make it some, let's manufacture some lame ass reason why you're getting a title match and then, you know, we'll turn it into a feud instead of it like actually just being treated as like a a legitimate, you know, swerve. You are the man. Like it felt like Mercedes match, Adam Copeland's match, and the Anarchy in the Arena match were way more hyped than anything that Swerve was involved in on this card. Pretty much. Pretty much. Uh, yeah. Pretty much. That's all I can say about it. <laughs> so I, can... I mean, I'm a Swerve fan. I've... He me too. Deserves, he deserves to be world champion, but... Yeah, me fuck, too. Fuck, man. It, it's, and it's not even Swerve's fault, because he's over. Yeah. He's got the popularity. It's literally the way that he's booked. And I hate keep coming back to that, but Tony's not doing them favors. No. God, no. But. I, mean, I, 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 mean, they, I, I do like that they touch back to the that spot where Swerve attacked Nick Wayne in his uh, ring at his home. Like That's the one thing I actually loved about this whole thing, because they touched on that. But yeah, other than that, it's I don't know. I just <laughs> I I mean the match was fine. Again, it's another one of those things where the match was fine. There was nothing really wrong with the match. It just the way it was booked and the way that it was leading up to it, it felt like a mid card match with a world champion because it was not booked as a world title match, in my opinion. Pretty much, yeah. 
So, yeah, we go from that to, as Justin Roberts said, the shit show. Yeah. The uh, anarchy, anarchy in the arena match, which was literally a fucking shit show. <laughs> yeah, you got the elite, which was uh, Matthew Jackson, Nicholas Jackson, Kazuchika Okada, and Jack Perry defeating Team AW, which was Brian Danielson, Cash Wheeler, Dax Harwood, and Darby Allen, who replaced. Eddie Kingston because he got injured, which I, I don't know what injury he's got, but he's out injured. Yeah, he got I think he got injured in New Japan, didn't he? Yeah, he injured in New Japan defending uh, the the title over there, and uh, the when, when he lost to uh, uh, who did he lose to? What was his name? I can't remember his name off the top of my head, but yeah, he, he it was when he lost the title. It was on the spot. It was on a it was on a stupid spot again. Um, that shouldn't have probably been in the match, uh, but it was, and he got hurt on it. So, um, you know, this Anarchy in the Arena match, I love the concept of the match. Like, I think it's a great a great concept. I don't have any issues with it. Jack Perry obviously pinning Daniel Bryan, or sorry, Bryan Danielson, um, you know, definitely means that there's going to be a push for Perry here in the near future, which I think we all expected was coming. This is the one booking like result that actually really made sense as far as storyline is concerned um, yeah. for the elite to win. Uh, whether you hate them or like them or whatever, it doesn't matter. This was the correct result uh, in, in this match. Uh, the flamethrower with Darby Allen. I mean, come on. I it just like how dumb, like, yes, I understand it's Darby Allen, right? And I get that Darby Allen has done some crazy shit. So it's totally believable that he could be carrying around a flamethrower, I, I guess. But why? Why? What's the, what's served the purpose? Jack Perry still got the pin. So what was the purpose, right? Like, it, 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 it just, it, it, it's just mind-numbingly, like, let's do a spot for the sake of doing a spot, basically. Well, I just want to know how Darby Allen is still fucking alive. Well, that too. Some of the summer <laughs> shit. He, he, he breaks his ankle. Yep. Then, not long after that, he ends up getting hit by a fucking bus. <laughs> that alone, they should have kept him out for the next fucking 12 months while he recovers. But no, here he is, doing an anarchy in an arena match. And doing crazy but, shit. Like Yeah, doing crazy shit. Yeah. Well, fuck. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, the match was good. Again, again, it was another one of those matches that was really good. The storyline actually invested in this one. This was actually a match that people could tune into if you cared about what was happening. Um, it just... I, the flamethrower is stupid. I'm sorry. It's dumb. It's dumb. Like, yes, sure, it's Darby Allen, so I guess you could technically believe yeah. it, but it's just dumb. Like, just leave it the out. One, There's no need for it. The one thing that got me going that Martha Hart was in the arena, and I'll touch on that once we finish with this match, is that Martha Hart was in the arena, and they did the uh, Darby Allen getting lifted up by the zip thing and just hanging there by his feet. <laughs> that bit just... Why? I... I wish I knew. Again, it's it's AEW. I I have stopped questioning a lot of what they do because I have no choice but to. Otherwise, I'm yeah. gonna, my my brain is going to melt off. So. Yeah. Yes. Pretty much. But yeah. But yes, anyway, Martha Hart was, as I said, Martha Hart was in the uh, was in the arena. Uh, she, uh, her and Tony Khan, who's apparently miraculously healed from his broken neck and no longer wearing the neck brace, announced. And this bit made me think they're just copying WWE here. But they announced that the winner of the Owen Hart tournaments for mm-hmm. men and women will get a future. Uh, World Championship match. And again, the finals of the tournaments will be in Calgary, Alberta, Canada. 
I, I, so, I, I'm okay with that. That is one thing I'm okay yeah. with, even if it's even if it's like sniping the the king and the cre- king, king and queen of the ring, you know, like, like a little bit. I'm okay with it because at least it adds a little bit of an importance to that tournament, right? Like yeah. it like gives gives that tournament a legit like something to look forward to esque type thing, right? Like it's okay, the tournament means something other than just yeah, winning, you know, a, a, a title that you don't defend or anything like that, right? Because the the last two years, it hasn't meant shit. Right. I mean, I've I've forgotten who's like, I I think Ricky Starks won one of them and he hasn't, oh, hang on, will they win? (laughs) Yeah, I was, yeah. Starks, Starks won, and I feel like Starks, and Starks may not even be there, so, you know, here in the near future. Yeah, well, that's it. So who did win that? So you had Britt Baker and Adam Cole winning the first one. Willow and Starks winning it last year. So. Yeah, they are. I don't know. Hey, that's AEW for you. So. But yeah, they've got plenty to look forward to for Forbidden Door, which is coming up at the end of next month. Uh, now that we've got plenty of CMLL and New Japan guys uh, showing up, what got me was Will Ospreay's face and swerve at the in the future at Forbidden Door. Yeah, he, uh, yeah. won the Casino Battle Royal. Yeah. So he Spe- put the t- he of... put the oh, go ahead. They put the international championship on Will Osprey. Now you're doing my world championship match. Yeah, uh, that's I don't, I, I don't understand it. It again, the booking aspect. Of, there's no, there's no long term plan for a lot of this, and you know. Uh, it just it, it's very weird to me uh how they do it speaking of weird and odd and doesn't make any fucking sense this casino gauntlet match oh, the did casino you watch dynamite world. last night no the casino gauntlet match did you watch this yeah, watch yeah, the gauntlet. dynamite last night yeah yeah i watched yeah i watched it yeah uh that's not a gauntlet match the, It, no, if it's no. if it, if it's sudden death and it's the first pinfall wins, that's not a gauntlet match. No, it's a yeah, it's a gauntlet <laughs> crossed with a fucking battle royal crossed with a fuck knows what. It makes Tony zero sense. Khan. It doesn't make Tony any sense Khan to me at all. Shit that he, Tony <laughs> can't book shit that only he wants to see that, and in his head makes complete sense, but. It doesn't make any sense. It's not a gauntlet match. Don't call it a gauntlet match. That's not what a gauntlet match is about. No. A gauntlet no. match is a gauntlet's match is somebody gets defeated, somebody else comes out. That's a gauntlet match. Yeah. So. But yeah, I, Tony Khan's gonna continue booking the way he's booking. But yeah, I don't know. So, so yeah, that's both shows done. Uh, we've yeah, that's it, the end of those two shows. Got the NBA finals coming up shortly. Uh, just got one more match left in the conference finals, which is a game five between the Mavs and the Wolves. Who do you think will win that win that series? I mean, at the moment, uh, the Mavs are up uh, three one. Three or... three one. Yeah, it's going to be hard for Minnesota to win four straight. I don't know if they're going to be able to do it. Uh, I think Minnesota has the better team. I just don't know if they're going to be able to do it. Carl um, Anthony Towns, if he plays the way that he's continued that he played in Game Four, um, then they have a legitimate shot. But I don't know. Uh, I think it's going to be Dallas Boston, and honestly, I would not be surprised to see. If Boston to sweep Dallas if that happens. 
Yeah, Boss. I, I, I got Boston winning winning this as well. They, they were dominant against the Pacers. So as long as Jalen Brown continues playing like how he's playing, I don't see anybody stopping Boston. So yeah. No, yeah, yeah. Boston, it's just Boston is serious to lose. So yeah, I think so too. So yeah, that that's the show for today. Uh, Make sure you follow us on your on all your socials, on all on all of my socials, Michael's socials, all of that fancy shit uh, at JPA Podcast on Instagram and Twitter. Uh, just putting around podcasts on Facebook, Bulldozer Williams on YouTube. I, not that I post much on YouTube, but it's there. I've only post shorts and whatnot. Uh, and, yeah, we'll uh, catch you next week. And uh, thanks again for joining joining me on the show, Michael. It's always a pleasure having you on the show. As always, as always. I love doing this, so. Yeah, it's much appreciated. But until then, catch you around. <laughs>